Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. And uh, next, uh, we will be the last session of this KC, and the topic is encryption. And there will be uh, five uh, talks in this session. And the first one is public key encryption with opening. And uh, Antio will give the talk. Thank you very much. Um, right, so this is uh, the second of two uh, SOK papers uh, accepted to this conference. So let me just uh, thank the organizers for including SOK papers finally. I hope that this is something that will be done more in the future as well, because I believe that these are in general important and useful kinds of papers, right? So um, my work is about uh, public key encryptions with openings. So this is uh, a class of generalized security notions that consider corruptions of one kind or another. So I've drawn here a um, you know an adversary in terms of, as a uh, that is looking out over a crowd of multiple users, and it can corrupt a subset of the users. So that means again the secret key of the user, or it might be opening uh, an uh, encrypted message to receive the randomness used in uh, the encryption process and the mes underlying message as well. So these are the different kinds of openings that we're considering. Uh, so this is a uh, joint work together with uh, Carlo Bonat and uh, Martin Stam. Um, that's this. If I do like this, hopefully, yeah, there you go. So just briefly, uh, we probably all know the basic NCCA game for public key encryption, right? So we have the experiment where there is a public key and a private key and some hidden secret bits. Um, the adversary gets the public key and it outputs uh, two messages, M0 and M1. And uh, it gets a challenge encryption and it also has access to some decryption oracle. And then at the end, it guesses what uh, the value of the bit is and wins uh, even only if it guesses correctly. So this is, uh, this is a standard situation, and what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, ask the question, is this realistic, right? So we have a single key pair here, a public key, private key pair. So the first thing you can do to try and approximate the real world in your model is to allow for multiple users. Um, so then we get multi-user in CCA, which has been uh, thoroughly studied. Um, and then in addition, uh, you can... Um, you can have, uh, ask, uh, have it asked for several challenges per user um, to any of the end users, right? And the nice thing about this is that the security notion that you get is still polynomially equivalent to normal single user in CCA. You get a, a parameter like a, a loss in the security parameter, which is just linear in the number of users and the number of challenges. So if you want to account for this, you just increase your security parameter according to the loss, but you can still use the same encryption algorithms. So it's sort of fine. Um, right, what, what do we mean by a, a model being more general than another? And uh, what we mean is that the game is easier for A to win because it has more targets to choose between. For example, you could consider a, a, a public key encryption scheme where with some very small probability, the key that is being output is actually broken and it's recognizably broken. And then if the adversary has uh, many different users to choose from, maybe they can recognize, oh, here's a weak key, I can attack that one. And so uh, in that case, the system would be broken here. Um, but uh, yeah, so one crucial thing uh, in order to say that this is strictly more general is that uh, the adversary at the end of the game still only needs to guess a single bit. So you see I've drawn uh, like this bit on the top of all of these heads. This is to say that uh, for each challenge, the adversary uh, gives an M0 and an M1, but in the entire game, no matter who it challenges, it will always be either M0 or always be uh, M1 that is being encrypted and returned. So it's still only this single bit that needs to be challenged. All right, uh, so okay, how can we generalize this further? Well, we can allow the adversary to corrupt some of the users, right? To get the private keys, of the users and ask, do we still get security? The answer is yes. Uh, so this harkens back to uh, one of our previous works two years ago, but uh, long story short, the exact same reductions work when you add these uh, corruptions. So we're still good. Um, yeah, and again, it's strictly general, uh, more general. So uh, we get something that's even more realistic. But 
a, a sort of funny thing happens here where there is a segregation between corrupting a user and challenging it. Because you can sort of see that if you allow the adversary to recover the private key and then challenges the same user, it will learn this global bit, right, of the security game. And the game is trivially broken. So we have to disallow both challenging and corrupting the user, which, when you think about it, seems strange, like a, a bit of a strange requirement. Like, why, why would you need this? Like, in the real world, there, there is no reason why an adversary shouldn't uh, be able to try and break your crypto system and then later on learn your private key because you, I don't know, leaked it on a post-it note or something like this. Uh, and yeah, there, there doesn't seem to be any good reason why you shouldn't be able to model this. Okay, so one thing that you can do is that you can uh, give everyone separate uh, bits instead, separate challenge kits. Um, and now you get uh, a sort of like a neat extra that the challenges themselves may now be opened as well. So you get different kinds of openings, right? So you can uh, now not only open the private keys, but you can actually open the challenges to see the underlying message, see the encryption randomness that was used. We call this sender opening. Uh, and the only thing that is being leaked then is the challenge bit pertaining to that particular user. And then if you want to make sure that this is still strictly general, uh, you can have a pool of uh, users and a pool of challenge bits and you can allow the adversary to sort of mix and match the, uh, the, the bits and the users as, 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 as they prefer. Um, so this is, this is nice. Now you have something that is even more realistic again, um, and it's still uh, equivalent to NCCA. So if you do this uh, segregation where uh, the adversary can freely choose which bits and which users to challenge and mix and match as it prefers, uh, then you get a concrete loss in the number of users, the number of challenge bits, and uh, the number of challenges. So multiply together, of course. But still, it's like polynomially equivalent. So fine, right? We, we're done. We can sort of pack our stuff and go home. So this, this is where we were at when we started this project. Um, and then we started reading related literature. Um, and we came across some related notions that are, they're talking about completely different security notions than we are. Um, apologies, by the way, for the small text there, but the highlighted bit says, the attacker is allowed to corrupt some of the receivers and learn the secret keys that encrypt some of the self attacks. So it's clear that they're talking about the exact same scenario, right? But the security model is very different and it's called selective opening attacks. And it's not polynomially equivalent to NCCA. It is strictly stronger. There exists a separation. And so at this point, we're sort of scratching our heads. Like, what is going on here? I, I thought we had just shown that you can do arbitrary openings and still have polynomial equivalence to good old NCCA. And here, you just do like a small difference in the way you choose to model this. Uh, and you get uh, an, uh, a super polynomial uh, um, separation. Okay, and so, and then we started looking at some other unrelated notions again called non committing encryption. Um, here, the highlighted part says security against adaptive corruptions is obviously the more realistic notion for practical applications. And by adaptive corruptions, again, we're talking about exactly the same thing. But it is notoriously difficult to achieve for public key encryption. And once again, I'm scratching my head, like we just show that everything that uh, satisfies NCCA. Yeah. Also, is also secure uh, in the presence of these adaptive corruptions. And furthermore, uh, it is a well-known result going back from the early to the early 2000s, actually unachievable in the standard model. And by unachievable here, uh, technically we mean for uh, exponentially sized message spaces. So you can construct non-interactive, non-permitting encryption for like single bit encryption, for example, but if you want something useful, essentially, um, you know, has arbitrarily large message spaces, then it is unachievable in the standard model. Easy to achieve in the random oracle model, as long as you can program the random oracle, uh, but unachievable in the standard model. And that is like, once again, intuitively, this doesn't make any sense at all. Because what we're trying here is that we're trying to model the real world, right? We're trying to answer the question, <laughs> how much power will the adversary gain by being able to compromise unrelated ciphertexts to the one that you're trying to prove security of. Intuitively, you would say there is none. Uh, 
we can show that you get uh, you know, a loss factor. Whether or not this loss factor means anything is, of course, a philosophical discussion. But down here, you get something widely different. So um, the other interesting thing we notice is that uh, even though there are many authors who have worked on all of these notions, uh, these papers seem to never cite each other and more or less just like ignore each other's existence in a way. So this is the bridge that we're trying to, uh, the, the, the gap that we're trying to bridge here is to actually systematically compare these various approaches to uh, modeling um, security in the presence of adaptive corruptions. All right, so that's the, that's the setup for our, our SOK. So we came up with this framework. So this is sort of the skeleton of our systematization. And it is uh, four different philosophies of, uh, of security, uh, I should say. So we have two indistinguishability philosophies that you can choose to go for, and two simulatability ones, and each of them come sort of in an a priori and an a posteriori version. Um, so if we just look at what we get without compromise, um, this is sort of the information theoretic version of what a priori indistinguishability looks like. So it's like given uh, two different messages, M0 and M1, uh, what is the probability that you observe a uh, certain side effects, right? And that is, uh, that, that gives us a good old NCCA notion that we're all used to. If you do a posteriori in this instability, you sort of uh, flip the role of the side effects and the message and you say, okay, you're given a message. What is the probability that the underlying uh, no, you're giving the side effects, sorry. Uh, what is the probability that the underlying message is either M0 or M1? So in this case, you sort of get the challenge first, and then towards the end of the game, one message is revealed to you, and you sort of try to have to guess whether the, the, the message that you get is the one that was encrypted or, you know, an independent one. Uh, we don't really have this for uh, public key encryption, but if you think about it, it's sort of reminiscent of can uh, indistinguishability notions where you get either a real key or a random key and one of them are uh, encapsulated. Uh, over to the simulatability notions, here you get more uh, the sort of um, information theoretic security that uh, Shannon was defining back in the 40s, where he's saying that uh, the probability that you observe a message given that you've observed the ciphertext should be the same as the probability that you have observed the message in the first place. So the ciphertext shouldn't add any information that can be exploited. Uh, for uh, PKE, this is um, familiar once again in the form of uh, semantic security. So uh, particularly uh, Goldleich's uh, version of uh, semantic security that uh, uh, Goldmas and Mikali introduced. Um, and finally, you get a priority simulability, where once again, this is sort of things where the probability of observing the cyber text, knowing uh, the underlying message should be the same as the probability of uh, observing the cyber text to begin with. Mm -hmm. And I think actually Shannon back in the day proved that these two were equivalent definitions. Uh, and this is uh, more like universal composability, right? Where you have these baby simulators that simulate the entire universe, essentially. Um, the interesting thing is that without compromise, uh, these are all equivalent notions, right? Not tightly so, of course, but you can show reductions between all of these. Ignoring this one. Um, so in that case, we can just continue to use NCCI and be happy. Uh, but with compromise, you get uh, a very different scenario. So on the top here, you get this multi-user NCCI with corruptions, which I was talking about in the beginning. And then you get these notions of selective opening attacks. So you have uh, two versions of selective opening attacks. One is indistinguishability based, and one is simulatability based. And then uh, here you get non committing encryption at the end. Uh, and interestingly, there, there's like a lot of papers out there from the past, I would say, 10 years or so, studying in particular how the SOA notions relate to each other. Uh, and it's, it has been shown that simulatability-based SOA is strictly stronger than indistinguishability-based SOA, which is strictly stronger than NCCA once again. So there's an, uh, an implication in this direction and a separation in this direction. And uh, the same goes for non-committing encryption. There's an impl uh, implication separation for that one as well. So you get a sort of like a neat hierarchy out of this. So uh, just to uh, quickly show, um, yeah, I, I have to speed up my notice. Um, 
I want to show like briefly how the different games work. So I said here you get a challenge ciphertext and then you get either the real or the fake message. Uh, and here there are simulators. So uh, notice in particular the, the role of the simulators in SSO versus NCE. So um, here the simulator is simulating an adversary and some distinguisher has to try and find out whether it was an adversary or a simulator that played in this experiment. Well, in this case, the simulator is actually simulating the game, and then the distinguisher has to figure out whether the adversary was playing a real or a simulated game. And as usual, the, um, the difference for the simulator is that uh, it only uh, receives the length of the message, not the message itself, and, should, and still it should be able to produce um, you know, um, valid looking outputs. Uh, and then there are four kinds of opening. Uh, so these uh, are the ones that we consider. That's only the message leaks, only the, the message and the randomness leaks, the private key leaks, or all of the above leaks. And if you sort of uh, multiply these together, you see that we get 32 notions of security, which is, you know, a lot to try and uh, map out. Actually 30, because it turns out that only message leaking for NCE is meaningless because the adversary already knows the message. But yeah, that's details. So this is the hierarchy that I was mentioning. Um, for the, um, uh, for the uh, CCA situ uh, CPA situation, it's uh, kind of well known, right? You have separations upwards and implications downwards. And then when messages leak, no, uh, no when private keys leak, uh, both simulatability so and NCE are unachievable in the standard model. Um, for CCA, there is actually a very interesting gap here, an open problem that we would expect that simulatability SOA implies indistinguishability SOA, but a sort of straightforward reduction that doesn't seem to work. So, interesting. I don't know how to solve it, but uh, that's future work. And I'll just mention that if only messages leak, then mostly you get stuff that is fully. Uh, equivalent again, like yeah, there are no separations. So it turns out that the reason why you get separations here is that if you have the private key or the randomness used, you can sort of verify that you were given the correct randomness, for example. Um, but uh, in this case, where only the messages leak, the reductions can do all sorts of fakery tricks that leads to uh, these implications. So these are the figures from uh, taken from the paper with all of the 30. Uh, notions that we are uh, sort of systematically and asymptotically in this case mapping out, right? So most of this is known results. Uh, some of them are conjectures that are the uh, you know dashed ones, uh, and some of these I think uh, yeah over here for example the the, the fat arrows are the gaps that we close in this work. All right, so a uh, short note on achievability. So. Uh, once again, this means only messages leak, and then everything is, you know, uh, equivalent again. And for um, uh, eight CCA-like notions, I already told you, then you get these uh, polynomial losses, but it's uh, polynomially equivalent still. Uh, then people have built constructions that achieve these. So this is uh, indistinguishability SOA um, with uh, messages leaking and, uh, no, sorry, private key leaking and randomness leaking. And then we would expect that there would be a, a construction that achieves both at the same time. So this is all in the standard model, um, while uh, these four notions become unachievable uh, in the standard model, but once again, easy to achieve in the programmable random oracle. All right, so I'm reaching my conclusion, um, and I would like to comment on which model of corruption is the right one, right? Like a bit philosophically here. It's, it's, it's an answer that is difficult it's a question that is difficult to answer. Um, so we're sort of giving, uh, like, we're suggesting that you should look at this in terms of applicability. So what do you want to use these notions for? Now, interestingly, there are very, very few constructions out there that actually use uh, selective opening attacks for any constructions. We are aware of like one paper that uses SOA to build a protocol. But there are very many papers that study SOA, very few that uses them. That's interesting. Anyway, short answer, stop worrying and start using in CCA, you know. And if you want tightness, you just, uh, you, you add multiple uses and stuff. But there are cases such as for, you know, um, threshold systems and stuff like this, where you actually need 
to stay single bit, single challenge bit, and be able to open the challenges. In that case, maybe ISO CCA would be the one to go for. But ISO CCA turns out it doesn't work if you have a message space that is not efficiently conditionally sampleable. So if your message space involves all sorts of trapdoors and stuff, um, then you can't do this. Then go one step up, use SSO CCA, right? Okay, but maybe you need to avoid this weird message sampling that this, uh, these SOA notions seem to introduce because you need to first give the challenge and then sample a message and then give it out. And that's really annoying to work with. In which case, you can go to the very top of uh, the hierarchy and use NCE CCA. But yeah, once again, if you, if you don't need to worry about this, don't worry about this and just save it. So that's it for me. Thank you very much. I think the application of the PA reporting to this field is uh, really required. Right? So, um, for like just using for the change of key to use in the a symmetry in the question in the beginning is actually uh okay. mm. so everything um like in day or I put it day or I in the application. Right. Should I have a microphone maybe? All right, so if I understand the uh, question correctly, the uh, the question is, um, how do the SOA notions uh, sort of end up if you apply them to CHEMS so that you just share uh, keys to be used for symmetric encryption? So the interesting part is that a lot of the struggle with uh, getting these implications to work uh, comes from having to sample from non-uniform uh, message spaces. So for CHEMS, you are actually doing most of the time uniform sampling from a key space. Uh, and if I'm uh, not entirely wrong, then you actually get a lot more equivalences between SOA and in CCA. Um, so uh, this is uh, this is something to worry about for the PKA, PKE case. Now, if you use CAMS to make a hybrid PKE, then you're back to square one, right? Then you then you're studying PKEs again. So, yeah, but it's it's something to look into. It's a, it's an interesting point. Um, yeah, there's a question. Right. So this is a fun one, right? Because um, I said that uh, non-interactive, non-committing encryption is uh, impossible in the standard model in the sense that you need to program random oracles in order to achieve it. Now, deniable encryption is sort of the same as non-committing encryption in the sense that uh, for any ciphertext, you should be able to open it to a message of your choosing. But now that you're requiring that the end user should be able to do this. And the impossibility result implies that the end user would then have to be able to program random oracles, which means that deniable encryption is not only unachievable in the standard model, but actually just fully unachievable under our definition. Now, if it's interactive, then you can do it. And if it's for small message spaces, like a single bit, then you can also do it. So this is uh, being applied elsewhere. But this is also, like we have a note about it, but this is why we didn't include it in the hierarchy. Right, I have one final thing I just wanted to say, uh, just shameless self-promotion here, but I set up a, a Discord server for people trying to understand Chen's algorithm for LWE. So if anybody wants to join my Discord server, which already has more than 350 members, please uh, go ahead and scan the QR code. Thank you very much. And the second call uh, will be uh, com compact selective opening security from LWE, mm -hmm. and the king will be the top. You load the Mario. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
This one? This one? Oh, ah. No, wait. Uh, how to make full view here? Ah. Okay, uh, you hear me? Okay, yeah, this is us. Um, my name is Akim and today I want to sing for you Folk of Pets Made Done. I want to show you my, my uh, 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 one of my dear beloved uh, former um, uh, colleagues in PTH. Uh, we got a spot today, a uh, content that works to your PTH team, um, which we hope uh, to be a first part of uh, secure. Let's find out about that. All right, uh, as already introduced, um, thank you all the security. Um, let's uh, go a bit more into details in the global security. We have multiple senders and one receiver. Uh, and uh, we think so, the receiver does this, here does the stuff here, uh, generates or here, here. Uh, they generate a uh, public key and script here. Uh, with uh, senders, they all get a public key. They all have messages which are correlated. And they use independent encryption randomness. They all encrypt their messages uh, with the same public key and triple uh, receiver uh, ciphertext. Uh, and I think that I mentioned the messages from the senders and they all come from the uh, from the same uh, or they, they may all be jointly distributed, uh, jointly centered. So they may be correlated in uh, uh, a block of space. And uh, adversary, as usual, adversary gets to see the public key, he gets to see all his uh, cyber text, that's all. And now he may adaptively corrupt some of the sentence. So he may force our sentence to show him the message and the randomness. And that's where things get tricky. Uh, we want that if this happens, the, you can read this, the security guarantee is that, is that even if that happens, if, uh, even if this uh, adversary corrupts a lot of uh, different senders, and Opens their randomness in their messages. Uh, and even if the messages are correlated with each other, he cannot learn any more about the remaining messages than what he would learn trivially. And this is this is tricky to capture. This is a really obnoxious uh, uh, security for this is very formalized this because they are the messages, messages that they are correlated in some really hard to capture way. Uh, I'm gonna show you form definition exactly. That's form definition. Uh, let's go over this. I'm sorry. Uh, which uh, turns out a random key and he turns public key secret here. And so he gets a public key. Now he specifies um, some, uh, there's some kind of code here. He specifies a kind of distribution M that jointly sends uh, messages for all the senders. Then the challenge now also has a encryption uh, randomness that's independent. Uh, and then he gets a cyber text. Uh, and so he gets a cyber text. Now he chooses the uh, the set of uh, sentences was corrupt. Now, the slightly part, the chance to resemble the messages conditioned on that the indices that the uh, subtext is getting get old, um, we basically have the same message. So, here's some, uh, 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 resemble the message, the message vector conditioned on being equal on some basis, the public technical, also, I think. And then, to use uh, some of the old messages or old values. And uh, either the old message vector or a new message vector. And then the essay has to decide if you got uh, the messages actually corresponding to the such text you received or if you uh, got a new uh, message vector, which may be correct in some sense. Yeah, so that's the unformed definition. I'm sorry. Um, also, in the CCA case, the adversary gets in the control all the time. It's uh, unsurprising. Uh, all right, and um, uh, yeah, as Hans mentioned, this, this is not only in CCA security, they are complex examples, uh, artificial product examples, of course. Um, yeah, uh, and we already have um, uh, in say, open secure public encryption from uh, Nexus. Uh, there was some uh, works uh, years ago, but this is kind of concept of like compact. This means we have a super constant subtext expansion. So they, are, they wouldn't be nice in reality. We already have compact uh, public, uh, like public encryption, uh, but uh, yeah, not from quantum resistance assumptions, from like assumptions. Um, so that's our, our result. We uh, built it first, allegedly, quantum resistant, second opening CCA secure public encryption scheme. 
and we need LED and um, Paris uh, peer to run on campus and so on. Yeah, and our technique is a UV or CSV for new tool, GSWFHD, and a nice compression check of messages. All right. Okay, the um, good thing is just a recipe. Uh, we don't need to uh, invent reveal again. We can use a recipe. We need four ingredients. We need uh, loss in chapter functions, all of my loss in chapter functions. Uh, I invest in your cache functions. And uh, one time statistics, if you are lossy, authenticated, you could see. Uh, and we have this, you can all run a full machine. That's nice. Um, okay. I'm sorry, but for us, the system I show you how this works. Um, you have to go through this. So, it's basically hyper encryption with a few more steps. The uh, Jared already had X, the uh, hashing to get a key, then we encrypted to see it with the loss of the script to see to get the actual payload, to the uh, right actual payload. Now we use the thread pet X and run through the LTM to get some uh, vector Y, which is going to be important. Uh, y also comes from the ciphertext. Now, I'm sorry, we generate an uh, uh, initial tab on T1. Uh, we put Y and the random pet X and T1 into the area that we do all of our tab function and get a second non slave value Y drive. It's, it, it comes into ciphertext. Um, it makes sense. Um, trust me. If you want to decrypt, uh, if you're going to invert, so you're going to take out it, you have to go and invert Y to get this. And then you use the hash function to get your key uh, K, and that's how you get the message back. And we have to check that uh, our angular T F on input uh, the tag part T1, the second tag part Y, and X, uh, IG outputs to this Y prime there. If it doesn't, then you have That's not our check for our auto output is open for system. Uh, Okay, okay. The good, now the good news. Uh, this, uh, the last few weeks we had an uncle secure. Uh, 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 we can even have compact size. Uh, the problem are with first and parts. Um, you have to build it from LV plus PRS. Uh, and you want to now put in a compact layer. You already exists in a non compact layer. Okay, uh, let's jump to our. Let's, okay, first, let's talk about ATFs here. Most of you already know lost chapter functions. Uh, I'm going to repeat this. A loss in traffic function allows me to uh, generate keys in two modes, injected and loss mode. Um, so in mode, I get the inversion key and ablation key. In loss mode, I only get the ablation key. Now I can use the ablation key to um, evaluate my ATF on um, domain point six. And I get an uh, image point one. Um, I can use the both ablation keys. And in the injected case, I can use the inversion key. So that's our first property we need. Correctness. If I erase injective key and then work, I have to get the same extract, the same domain points, uh, like in like encryption scheme. Uh, and I want inestimability. So injective uh, uh, keys and lossy keys are inestimable. I can't just, uh, uh, they, they look the same. Uh, and I want lossiness. Uh, that's a strong guarantee. If I erase the lossy key, then I have to lose two L bits, uh, uh, L bits of information. My, Image space needs to be smaller by two power I, I, I'm guaranteed to lose elements of information. They're gone. I'm not I'm, I'm routine. Work. And we additionally want compactness. The bit size of, of image points is uh, linear with bit size of uh, domain points. That's special here. All right. Uh, let's construct it. Uh, uh, it's easy. Uh, almost trivial. Uh, you all got one. Uh, so if you want to, uh, or let you have just following, you can generate a key. We draw a uh, change of type and track door. Uh, we draw an HSP uh, and an image as the E. And our average keys now, uh, this is called the they work with 4 E plus uh, times S plus E plus B times G. Uh, I'm going to explain this. G is the kind of scheduled matrix. And B is uh, zero in lossy mode, injected in, uh, in uh, quantum injected mode. And this nice LV matrix here, that's our evaluation key. All right, uh, we're going to evaluate a point X, uh, model P. We do a point uh, nice thing, we scale it to make it large enough. Then we uh, bit decompose it with G, uh, G inverse. And then we just minus the vector with the evaluation key. That's how we evaluate the points. Um, and if you want to invert it, we do a following. Uh, now, this is ugly. Uh, I'm going to decompose my uh, error, my noise matrix into parts. and. Why base looks like this? It has this folder here, you can write it. Um, 
Now let me uh, call this part here back to G. Um, and now you can see, ah, this actually just simplifies it all to this form here. And that's nice because um, you can always use the private chat code to extract SG. <laughs> and if you know SG, then you can also uh, uh, call the second part here. They can yeah, commence with B uh, to get back um, what game method. That's how, how inversion works. All right. Um, so I hope I convince you all correctness is fine. Yeah, correct. Um, Instability uh, is also CC, that's uh, LV. And uh, lossing is based on counting arguments. And the trick is uh, in the lossing case, uh, our matrix is the sum of our low rank matrix and our short matrix. And our domain points, we basically turn them into, uh, into uh, zero one vectors. And then you can basically count that you have to use information. Right. And for practice, uh, you set the purpose accordingly, then everything's fine. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I hope you all believe me. That, that's, that, yeah, we have seen lots of chapter functions. Um, let's step up the game. Yeah, it's going to get more complicated. Now we're going to choose all our major chapter functions. Um, now we have a generator loop and it generates three keys a relation key, inversion key, tag key. And uh, the relation key is not in that injective velocity mode. It's it just a normal evaluation key. Now we have text. Text have two parts. Both parts are number bit strings. Uh, I mean, the first part can draw to uniform at random, doesn't matter. If you also draw the second tag part uniform at random, then with all the probability, you'll get an injective tag. Uh, but here's the, here's the thing uh, you have an L tag algorithm. If you use the tag key, which is usually secret, then you can extend the first tag part to a lossy second tag part. So you can extend uh, text to be lossy. And that's kind of secret, that's a trick. It's uh, only the, uh, uh, the, the call of a tag you can do that. So texts are in fact the lossy and the for evaluation. So we take the, the, the key and the, uh, one tag and evaluate. You get a lossy evaluation and uh, invert the loss to an invert frame. Right. And again, once we've got space the same properties, uh, you want correctness, uh, you want instability, so lots of uh, text and text are almost in uh, not tacky. And you want again lossiness. If you are ready for loss of tech, you have to use all uh, this information. And you want compactness, that's also new. Here comes a new thing. Uh, you want evasiveness. Lost text are evasive. Um, if you don't know the tag here, even if you get to see a lot of lossy text, you cannot generate them on your own. They, they are uh, really hidden. Right. Uh, yeah, here you have a formula with the difference outline in red. Um, don't think too much about this. Okay, um, let me show you how we construct this thing. Uh, this was our construction of uh, compact LTS. Um, and I claim all the major structure functions say they follow similarly. Uh, it's basically the same, this is a bit more slightly more important. Because now we have to fix our PRF. Uh, and the first is we draw our PRF key k with number of bits. We again generate the charge of pi trapdoor, and now for each um, bit of our key of our PRF key, we now draw uh, this, this matrix as uh, as i and i. And now uh, we for each uh, bit of our PRP generate such a matrix CI, uh, which now basically codes the bits uh, of the PRP. And you can now see uh, those matrices are basically dual GW encryptions of the uh, bits of our PRP. That's the trick. Um, yeah, now tech is the, 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 uh, the PRP. Right. Um, okay, so we have that. Uh, let's see if it works. So how do we have that? Uh, okay, how do you generate lossy text? That's easy. Uh, if you want to extend our tag part C1 to a lossy tag here, just have our PF on it. Uh, and we can do it because our tag here is our PF key. Yeah, if you want to have it, uh, now it gets a bit tricky, uh, content, but we can use a high level. Uh, use uh, the dual G sub to effectuate the virtual scheme to. Uh, I write the following function on uh, on this uh, on the inclusions of the PFTK. So this is a function that takes the PFTK as input, and if uh, our tag is non-lossy, so T1 and T2 are hard right in the circuits. If they are not lossy under this PFTK, then it outputs uh, X as output of the circuit output. If they are lossy, if they are lossy uh, tag pair, then it outputs zero. 
And we can write this on our hypertext server. We can write this like relation key because our relation is just encryption of the PIP k. Right. Uh, five minutes now, I have only two minutes. Uh, I can take five minutes. It's so fine. Uh, I can talk about each day all, all day long. Oh, okay. Uh, I hope I wasn't too fast. Uh, uh, yeah, we have to keep all these uh, things, all these uh, uh, properties. I claim it's, it's fine. You can trust me. Uh, I claim it off. It's basically the same again. It's uh, not really new. The new thing is you have to show evasiveness, and this I claim was on two rounds of OK, I think. That's, uh, yeah. Okay, uh, well, first of all, I just want to say uh, what can I say about parameters because this thing, why are we doing this, right? Uh, we want fun resistance, that's already gone, I'm sorry. Uh, we want uh, compactness because we want to have nice parameters because, I mean, it's, Hans had told you if you want to have something now, you need to say security. Uh, I will tell you about if your parameters are huge, who's that going to use this in reality, right? So we, are, we want compactness to argue for good parameters in reality. And here we have them, we have compactness, so uh, we can use, uh, for each bit we want to encrypt, we can use 10 or maybe 8 or 4 or even 2 bits of ciphertext, that's okay, not the best, but go somewhere. The problem is, uh, if you then sit down and uh, try to compute the actual parameters, they're huge. Like, you can maybe encrypt uh, 240 megabits of information, but you need uh, 2.4 Gigabits of, of, of ciphertext. It's not going to work out in reality. And the problem is, uh, I'm sorry, Salma, FHE sometimes. FHE makes things complicated. And also, PFs are also huge problem. You need PFs in NC1 because you want to throw some tricks. Show me reality of PF in NC1. I mean, I don't know. Uh, okay, that's the uh, ancient higher PF. Um, yeah, so, this is all very nice theory in reality. We're going to uh, meet some problems. Um, yeah, uh, and here's the thing, and uh, I just want to add what's the to the next talk. Um, the solution to it uh, is uh, you, can, you can, this is also the standard model construction, you can go, can go to a raw model and use it to recycle or commute transformation. Uh, and I think this, this would be a possible way to get very nice parameters. So, uh, yeah, I'm very excited for the next talk by Dr. Shin, and, and I hope you're excited too. <laughs> All right, that was it. Um, thank you for your attention. I uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Thank you. Simulation plays. Simulation plays. Ah, question. But also, I forgot something. Yeah, some means. Yeah. Okay. Uh, to confirm your answer, um, is not simulation. Uh, sorry. Uh, good question. Is not simulation based secure? So I told you there are two other constructions seven years ago. LNS is seven. LNS is S seven T is simulation secure. We are not. It is hard to to, to get this. So we are only in in in. In the session to secure. But yeah, it's a good good point. Um, if you can do that, then uh, yeah, good go this would be a nice contribution. Okay, I have, I have a question is uh, uh, how large is the approximate factor uh, of the LW problem? Uh, I'm going to get into what I ask. Uh, I'm going to ask about the modulus, right? Okay. You're going to ask about the modulus because of the chance paper, right? Or, uh, I just wonder if, if it is polynomial or sub exponential. Oh, okay, good question. So, first, uh, you can get polynomial. You get polynomial, but you need PRS and one You need to assume you have a PRS and one and you can get polynomial. Um, look, uh, maybe to, to have a the whole chance attack, uh, right now, I think it's huge modules, like, and at least n to the power four, five, even more. And I'm not an expert, and you can maybe fix this because there's a nice paper, FHE secures a key encryption. We are sure modulus dimension switching technique to bring down the modules of your ambition scheme, but this could uh, increase the dimension of cyclotex and then you could lose compactness. So I'm not an expert there. Yeah. I tried to read it, I didn't really understand it. Um, maybe one of the few years stopped. Okay, but thank you for the And the third talk is uh, selective opening security in the quantum random oracle model of three entities. And the will give the talk.
Okay. And so thank you for the introduction. And also thanks thank you for his great introduction, his talk. And so this is joint work with Jano And so sorry. Okay. In, okay, like this, right? <laughs> yeah. Um. Okay, because uh, the previous talks gave a very good introduction, so I here I just give a very brief review. Um. So let's consider the public key question. The certainty open in security is defined for PKE and PKE setting. So we consider receiver with uh, public key and secret key, PKSK, and we have a lot of senders, and the senders can use the public key to create the mess increase some message messages to this receiver using some randomness. And as mentioned in the previous talks, then the adversary can learn the message and randomness of the cyberpunks. So this is what we call selective opening security. And okay, the opening of the cyberpunks means that the message and the randomness are reviewed. And so you may ask, okay, so some cyberpunks, I mean, if a cyber text is open, then there's no secret information inside the cyber text. But how about the unopened cyber text? Do the unopened cyber text remain secure? And this is the, something that the selective opening security consider. And so the research history of selective opening is, uh, is very long. And they date back to the DN, sorry, DNRS 99, sorry. The, Audit rate, yeah, rate region. And so, why, why we consider the select open security? Because uh, also, hands give a very, very good uh, motivation. Like, uh, sometimes the center can be crafted, and uh, or the user use a very bad uh, pseudo randomness generator, which causes the randomness, uh, which will link the randomness. So, and it's very so the researchers spend quite a long time in find the correct definitions for SO security. So it turns out that you have two flavors of SO security. The one is the indistinguished phase SO, which which is also considered in the previous talk. And another one is the simulation based SO. And it turns out that the sim SO implies the in SO. So in this paper, so in this work, we consider the simulation-based SO security. And when defining the simulation-based SO security, we have two games. The real game, the real game comes, the real game models a real world adversary, attacks the attacks the skin in the real world scenario. Like it can, it has a lot of challenge cyber attacks, it can open some cyber attacks and yeah, find a challenge bit or something. And in the ideal world, the ideal the ideal game plays with the simulator. And in the ideal world, in the ideal game, there's there's all trivial information in the in the game. So like and let's go more, let's look at more detail. So in the real game, adversary can choose the message distribution. This is also mentioned in the last talk because uh, sometimes the messages can be collated. Uh, so, yeah, the message the, the message from this such distribution can be correlated, and of course the adversary in the real game can also open some charge side attacks. Like you can get the decrypted message and the readiness used for generating the side attacks. And if you consider CCA security, adversary can. It's also allowed to carry the decryption oracle. And in the ideal game, <coughs> so in this, this is all trivial information, the ideal game. So in the ideal game, the simulator can choose can also choose some message distribution, but now what all you can see is some some doomy, doomy information, like there's no public key here, no challenge side text, and no randomness. So it's all in trivial thing there. And the equation oracle basically returned nothing to the simulator. And so we say that PKE scheme is seen as well as CCA secure. If for any adversary, they always exist a simulator S that it can simulate, it can simulate all the behavior of the adversary. Yeah. 
I'm not going to explain too much detail, too many details in the in the in the security game, but uh this is how we define a simulation-based security. We consider simulator and the simulator simulates all behavior of the adversary. And okay, so it turns out that the CSOCC security is is a strict is strictly stronger than the normal in CCA security. Even if we consider multi-challenge in CCA security. Like um so one may ask, okay, can we prove the okay, can we prove the CSOCCA by using only using the NCCA? And it turns out that the, the naive hybrid argument plus IMDCCA approach does not work. So in the so in the CSOCCA security game, we have a lot of challenge cyber attacks. And the adversary is allowed to open something like say CI. And but if we use the if we construct we want to construct reduction from the NCCA security, then we cannot respond the relative of CI because because the NCCA security game does not provide any randomness. It just provides a message, but you do not know the randomness. So this naive approach does not work. And, and also when I ask, so we cannot use the hybrid arguments. But how about guess integrity? Like we guess which we guess the we guess uh, which ciphertext will not be opened by the adversary. But now, but if we use this method, then we have a security with very large security loss. Because basically, you need to guess a subset that which ciphertext will not be open. So, um, and we also want to introduce something about random oracle. So in the classical random oracle model, we model the hash function as an oracle, like the adversary sends some query x to the oracle edge, and then the oracle returns edge x. And now we go, so, so now we move to form the random oracle model. So now in the random oracle model, the adversary can query the superposition of input to the Q, QRO and then the QRO will return the superposition of output. This 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 model this more this uh QRO models the the uh, ability that the adversary can evaluate the hash function in a superposition locally. And so now, now in this paper we in this paper we just we just consider compact and efficient SOCC construction. The compact means that the ratio between the, the ratio of length of ciphertex and the length of public key is some small constant, and the length of ciphertex and the length of message, the, the ratio of them are is, is also small constant. We consider this construction because it's more practical and efficient. And so if you want to have a compact and efficient and efficient SOCC construction, a good starting point is considered the Fujisaki Okamoto transformation. Because the Fujisaki, the FOT, it preserved the underlying, it preserved the compactness of the underlying PKE scheme. And there are several construction in the literature. And here we want to highlight one word. What about construction, which is in the quantum random oracle model from SS19? And we find a very subtle gap in the proof, like a subtle gap that may make the proof invalid. The reason is that they, there, there is some hybrid argument issues inside the construction. Like we can construct an adversary which always opens some. Like we always open the first ciphertext, and then this is will make the hybrid argument that's not work. Like if you want to use hybrid argument, then you like you, you need a hybrid one, hybrid two, hybrid three. But if you the, the adversary always opens the first ciphertext, then you cannot fit, cannot simulate the hybrid one. So this is a very 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 subtle gap in the proof, and this also. This also, this once again shows that achieving SOCCA security is highly non-trivial. And but, but still we want we want to analyze the FOT in the, the SOCCA security of FOT in 
pure raw because FOT is widely used in post content TKE or PAN. And also, the an analysis in the classical room may not be sufficient for the post quantum security, full post quantum security, because we, for, for quantum adversary, we should not only consider the quantum computation power, but also the quantum cube, like civil position power. So the goal of, of our work is analyze the SO security of FOT based constructions in the pure room. Okay, so. So in the in, in our work, we start by considering one way CPA and we one way CPA PKE, and we try to we use the FO transformation to try to turn the one way CPA PKE into a SOCC PKE, and it turns out that we need a pure adaptive reprogram framework to achieve this goal. I'll explain more details later, and so. So actually, our works enable the uh, Q, uh, SOCCA echo construction in the Q room because, and we can instantiate this such construction from any post content assumptions. And okay, so let's look at some technical details. Uh, so we consider the variant of the FOT, FOT construction, like the FO equation. So in the FO equation, we sample the randomness R, and we use the R to we use the one way equation to increase the R. Well, the randomness of this one way equation is derived by the R, the, the, the randomness R. And then we use R and the side, the one way side like C to derive two keys. The first key is used for the general the produce uh, one time pad, another one is for Produce a one time man. So, this is a, the base construction of in our paper. And, and so, to prove the security, we need to construct reduction, right? So, how to construct the reduction? And if we start by some, we start by a one way secure, if we start by one way secure, one way, one way secure PKE, then so in the one way secure. The, the one with security gain, we just get the uh, some chart in cybertech C star, let's say C star. And because in this in the reduction, we do not get relevant because the relevance is, is basically the one with solution of the chart in cybertech. So we need to we need to find a very clever way to simulate the cybertech. So so this is a very informal description, but actually we um, we indeed just Sample the KMAC, the, the MAC key for the key for the one hand MAC uh, uniformly at random and produce the one hand pad also uniformly at, at random. And yeah, every, everything the same is the construction. And so now, how about so now the adversary can open any cyber text in the SO game? So, what's happened if the adversary wants to open, the, let's say, the I cybertext. Because we, we because we just consider the one-way game, and the one-way game does not provide any randomness. So it so it seems that we cannot respond to R because we, we do not we do not we, because the R is basically the one-way solution of the challenge cybertext. So and another problem is that even if we have R, even if we have R, if the like if, if we have R, even if we have R, but the side if the cyber is if the cybertech commits the randomness, then even if we have R, the adversary we can give R and N to the adversary, but the adversary can re-imprint the cybertech and find oh there's a there's a cheating. Yeah, you find some inconsistency in the simulation. So to deal with it, so the solution for this problem is that just reprogram R in the classical world. So like when the adversary want to open this type text, C I D I top I, and it just it just recom it computes the one time head P in this in this following manner, and then you reprogram the, to make the simulation consistent. So this is kind of technique, but technical, but uh, it works. And 
So because the reprogram point is actually the one-way solution of the cycle, so if the adversary can detect the reprogramming operation, then basically it breaks the one-wayness of the, the PPE. So by the one-wayness, then we can construct, we can, this means that we can construct a reduction from the one-way, the one-wayness. And, but, so this is the, some, some RO adaptive reprogram. But the part, but if we want to link this group to the quantum setting, here is the problem that we do not have any tools for computational pure adaptive reprogram. Here we say compute, computational means that, computational means that, so, so why do you consider computational uh, reprogram? Because normally <laughs> one is some computational assumption, like the one minus, but like the algo, the one minus of algorithm is based on some different help, based on the development assumption, and development assumption is some computational problem. And so we need this uh, computational thing such that it can support us to construct the computational reduction, which means that if the adversary is polynomial time and then the reduction is also polynomial time, then we construct an efficient reduction. And okay, so so now we let's look more details about the pure adaptive reprogramming work. We start by consider a very simple version like just for the two stage adversaries. So we start by, so this, so we first consider reprogram, reprogramming again. So in the reprogramming again, the, we first initialize, we have some initialization algorithm to produce the first input for the adversary. And with the first input of the adversary, the output, the, the adversary output the, some, the output the out zero, which, which is the output of this first stage, and of course, among in the first stage, adversary can carry the H, uh, Oracle H zero. I'm sorry that this form is very small. And yeah, and so to so to capture the so to capture the reprogramming operation, we use two algorithms. The F the function the algorithm F and the algorithm repro. So the algorithm F is just for generate the input for the next stage of adversary A and also produce some auxiliary information for reprogramming. And the repro algorithm captures some captures the reprogram operations. And in the game, we also consider all outputs from the adversary during the game. But this framework is start by considering a selective open security. So we, we need to consider all outputs from adversary because in the for the selective open adversary, we yeah the, in the in the SO security game, we, we we will consider the all outputs from the adversary, like which cyber attacks will are opened, were opened by the adversary. And so then we, we, we define the no, no reprogramming again, respectively. This it is almost almost the same as the reprogramming again, except that here we do not do any reprogramming operation. So okay, so to find the probability difference between H0 and H1, we use the approach from one way to hiding. We just consider a different set between this. Uh, the oracles in these two games, and then we can say, okay, the adversary cannot distinguish two games unless it curious the end points in S. Here's the curious, the curious, the term curious here is very tricky because we it, we actually use a very special way to define such event, but such curing event, and this framework can be proved by the adaptive one way to hiding. And then we, the, the framework, the, the framework for the two stage adversary can be generalized to the n stage. And we use the similar method to bound the difference, but it turns out that the straightforward hybrid argument plus the adaptive point fighting proof does not work. I think a quick explanation is that because the different set in each state can be each stage can be different, can be correlated. Just like in the SO setting, so uh, the hybrid argument does not work here. And so the probability, so the security part of our framework is like 
the very, the very thing, like if they have us been reprogrammed, uh, reprogrammed, if, the, if there are unreprogrammed operations in a game and the adversary period of two or two times, then we have this relation. That the security loss is very large. He has security loss, he, he has square root loss and the uh, n square times q. And okay, so this framework allowed us to do com computational reduction because the, the reduction will have a similar running time with the adversary. And this is very different from another QROM adaptive reprogram framework in GHHN21, which is just considered statistical reprogram. So I'm sorry. Um, so in this work, we try to analyze the future talk about model transformation in the QROM, which 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 will turn turn the one CPA PKE into SOCCA PKE. And we find that we, we need the new tools for this purpose. So we so we propose a QROM adaptive reprogram framework and to show that okay, we managed to show that one CPA PKE can be turned into a SOCC PKE by the FO transformation. And we also have some other results, like if we start with the loss inclusion, then we can get the high SOCC PKE. But I'm not going to explain the voice tightness here. And okay, so here's some common problems. So the security loss of our framework is quite large because we do not use in assumption in the in the one like if you if you're familiar familiar with the one way to hiding lemma and you know we have original one way to hiding we also have semi-classical one way to hiding and if we can add more assumption in the framework then i think we can improve the security loss and another question is that can we find more applications beyond so because adaptive reprogramming is widely used in our base construction so thank you thank you for your attention One, one question. Any questions? So sorry, you mean the yeah. Yeah, we, we need a map because we need a CCA security. If you do not have a map, then the adversary can just so like modify the cyber attacks and then yeah, and then get some advantage. We need a map to make sure that if the adversary modify the cyber attacks, then the decryption oracle will reject the, the modified the cyber attacks. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the next talk is public key encryption with and the next talk is public key encryption with the keyword research and the setting on the adaptive production and the uh, how do we give the talks. Uh, hello. Uh, thank you. I'm going to talk about public key encryption with keyword search and multi-user setting. Uh, this work is done by Yun Haoling, Hai Zhang, Jie Chen, Chong Huang, and Hai Feng Qian. Uh, we start by public key encryption with keyword search, text for sure. Uh, there are three parties, many data owners, a cloud, and a receiver. 
any data owner can share the data uh, to the receiver by the cloud. The receiver first generates a public key secret key pair. To share the data, the data owner uh, chooses a uh, chooses, uh, people encrypting send the seven heads in the day to the cloud. To retrieve the day, the receiver chooses a, a, a keyword, generate the chapter uh, using the secret key in the keyword. With the chapter, the cloud run, runs the test aggregation to search the day. If there is a seven heads matching the chapter, the day is sent to the receiver. Uh, however, only one user can be the receiver. So the day can share only with the receiver. Some user may share the day with many receivers. So our goal is to pass a packs in multi-user setting, new packs for sure. In our system, there are many users sharing day with each other. Uh, the first problem is to define the security model. As we have now, the security model should cover real attack as possible as. Uh, this, is, this is the security model of PAX. There is one public key, secret key pair. The public key is sent to the adversary. Uh, the, the adversary can get many chapters in one subtitle. So it covers one user, one subtitle. Multi chapter scenario without corruption. However, in a real system of mail packs, there are many users, each with a public key and secret key pair. Also, there are many chapters on the different secret key and many subtitles on the different public key. The attacker can get those public key and subtitles and may get some secret key and uh, chapter. Uh, so we need to cover, cover this and make sure the security of uncorrupted user. So we present a security model in multi-user, multi-challenge setting with, our, uh, with adaptive corruption for our mail packs. Uh, uh, this is our security model. There are many public key and secret key pairs. Those public key are sent to the attack. The attacker can get some secret keys. Uh, he can get some, uh, he can get many chapters on the different secret key and many uh, subtitles on the different public key. A successful attack to any uh, to uh, to any subtitles can make the attack to win the game. Uh, uh, we improve the security. Uh, by, pass, by proposing a security reduction, uh, which shows that uh, a, uh, the attack the attack a breaking the scan implies a uh, 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 aggression B, so in the hard problem P, we refer L as uh, security loss. In general, L is the number of users and queries made by the attack, but log L can result in lower uh, efficiency. So high security is uh, desired, where L is uh, constant, uh, which means L is uh, independent from the number of user and queries made by attack. It, it enables a scenario where the setting is huge or unknown. Our contribution can be summarized as well. We present a security model in NUNCC for mail packs. Uh, second, we present two mail pack skin over composite group, which are tightly secure. We proved the security with simple assumptions in the standard models. We present new technique for growing multi-user setting. Uh, for for uh, for growing multi-user security. Uh, it has been shown that any anonymous IP skin can be transformed into a Tax skin, uh, but what about mail packs? NUNCC is equal to multi, uh, multi instance, multi challenge setting with adaptive corruption in the sense that each user can run an IBE instance. 
Uh, however, there is no anatomy IPE in IPE skin in NIC. For anatomy and IPE in NIC, uh, the reduction is no type. Uh, yes, there are no type. They are most type depending on the security uh, parameter. Uh, second, uh, they they do no super corruption. Uh, for IPE in, 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 in INCC, uh, they suffer from the same problem than the raw dust. We emphasize that those problems are technically typical to get our result. Uh, dual system encryption is a powerful tool to constructing adaptive security IBE schemes. Uh, we we built a proof of LWIBE, uh, which is a classical skin by the dual system encryption. Uh, basically, LWIBE skin is uh is the bona and buoyant IBE skin. Our uh, composite of the group. In the in the proof for the seven types, we. Uh, we copy the turns in group GP1 to group GP2 by the SD1 assumption. SD means a uh, subgroup decision. Uh, there are a few secret keys, so we need to introduce entropy to each secret key. So we need two games. Uh, first, uh, we, uh, first of all, for our Secret key, we copy the turns in group GP1 to group GP2 uh, by the SD2 assumption. And, and then we introduce the entropy to the secret key by pairwise independence, which is an which is an information theoretical argument. In the last game, we can replace the message with a random message. Uh, however, there are some problems. The first problem is the dual system encryption mask the message in the separate types, but we need to mask the ID star in the separate types. The, the second problem is that the dual system encryption does no super corruption because if we return the uh, secret key as well as the master key, the attacker can distinguish the game immediately. Uh, the second the reduction is no type because they use use the information theoretical argument to introduce the entropy. Uh, this is our first skin. Uh, basically, our skin is LWIBE, our asymmetric composite order group. We have the following intuition. First, we mask only keyword W in subtitles. To do that, we introduce GP2 components in entropy to the subtitles. Also, uh, no need to introduce HP2 component to the chapter, which is very useful. Uh, it allows us to get title reduction. To address adaptive, adaptive corruption, we never introduce entropy to the chapter. So we can uh, return the chapter as well as the secret key to the attack. Uh, in, in addition, we generate our secret keys so we can return any secret key in any chapter to the adversary. To get title reduction, we introduce entropy by computation properties <laughs> instead of the information theoretical argument. Uh, this is uh, our group. Uh, we first uh, copy the turns in group GP two, uh, to, in group GP one to group GP two by SD SD assumption. We can transfer Q seven types by again due to the self reducibility. Uh, which means we can use an instance to pro to produce Q instance, and then we can use Q instances to uh, similar Q seven types. <laughs> Next, uh, we, for each seven types, we introduce the entropy to the seven types by the DTH assumption. Uh, we can transfer Q seven types by again due to the self-reducibility. 
in the last game, uh, for each seven types, there is a fish, a fish randomness in the seven types. So we can uh, replace the keyword with a random keyword. Uh, next is our second skin. The proof idea is similar. Uh, we may a comparison. Uh, the first skin has a randomized chapter, so its efficiency is uh, uh, slightly lower than the second skin. Uh, we know that the random chapter is important to the extension for uh, of packs. Uh, for the future world, uh, we wish to present more tightly security in secure encryption skin in multi-user setting. Uh, we leave an uh, over purpose to transfer our skin to come out the machine. Uh, thank, thanks. Okay, okay uh, I have a question. Uh, uh, what is the special interest to consider prime order version and uh, what are the main difficulties to adapt to success? Uh, in dual system encryption, there are two spans. One is uh, called a uh, normal span used for the functionality. functionality. Uh, the second is called uh, semi-functional uh, semi spans used for the proof. Uh, we, in the proof, we copy the certain so normal spans to the semi-functional semi spans. Uh, I mean, we copy the turns in group GP1 to group GP2. Uh, so the people appear not, in the, not only in the normal span, but also in the semi-functional span. However, the randomness, the randomness only appear in the, in the semi-functional span by those uh, techniques. So, uh, so we can now uh, randomize the keyword in the normal space. So this is the difficult. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, and the next talk is the last talk of uh, this BKC. And uh, the talk is Ring modular learning with errors on the linear linkage hardness and uh, applications. And the uh, third one will give the talk. So, this one. Okay, so six point introduction. I'm going to talk. I will talk about the ring and the modular LWM and the linear image parts and uh, applications. Um, this is the journal with Chichi Lai and the uh, uh, Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. So let me start with let's be still not true. Uh, we first record the commit and the proof paradigm. It combines uh, the commitment scheme and uh, the zero knowledge group and it enables to prove certain uh, relation about the committing messages. Uh, this paradigm com contains uh, four algorithms. The first one is KGN algorithm, which includes the secure pyramid and uh, outputs the public parameter PP. The second one uh, takes the public parameters and the message as input and outputs the commitment and uh, the corresponding randomness. So in the during the proof is uh, it takes uh, the PP a statement and the commit commitment uh, message and the randomness held as input and the returns a proof path. Uh, the verify algorithms uh, in, uh, with input PP is a statement and the proof path and the commit uh, and commitment. 
So uh, the graph is right forward and it follows the compactly follows the compactly of the minimum scheme and the uh, CKP. Oh, okay. There are two security properties of the teardown. The first one, the long summary uh, with the intuition that it's hard to pass the verification uh, its message to log belong to the language or the commit commitments are invalid. And the second one, uh, we mainly focus on it's called uh, simulatability. It states that uh, there exists uh, uh, there exists uh, in this a simulator that can simulate the uh, proof and the commitment without a message and the randomness. Uh, it's combined, uh, uh, in a sense, it combines the uh, high new uh, security of the commitment and the uh, zero knowledge security of the zero knowledge. So uh, let's move to uh, the next phase, the instantiation of this paradigm. For the commitment scheme, one can use the PDL scheme proposed by form and all in LNS, LNS, SCN, patient. The KG algorithm outputs the public parameter as a ring uh, matrix with the standard structure. So uh, the blue parts are uniform and random. For, uh, for the commitment, this it chooses a random small ring vector R as a randomness and a compute C equals to A times R plus the uh, uh, ring uh, vector concatenating with uh, zero and uh, the message X. So um, uh, there, there are another algorithms called uh, The BDLP scheme, a uh, commitment scheme, also it also uh, if it itself also contains another algorithm for the uh, open algorithms. It's a, a validation algorithm which checks the triple x, r, f, cetera as the equation and the, the uh, random sum is small or not. If it's true, we call this triple is a valid open and the invalid open otherwise. So uh, the binding security of DDLP com com comes from the uh, modular system assumption. This means that if there exist two valid uh, openings, x, r, f, and uh, x prime, r prime, f prime, uh, where x does not equal, does not equal to x prime, then we can obtain a solution for the MCS problem. In other words, if the MCS assumption holds, then the binding security also, also Okay, so the high uh, security of the scheme is based on the MLW assumption, specifically as a matrix vector product in the red frame can be converted into uh, an MLW instance according to the transformation uh, below. Uh, then we can argue that the message X can be hided as a red frame part is indistinguishable from the random vector. Okay, all right. We can further go into the lattice based uh, ZKP. For example, consider, considering the simple ZKP for the valid open uh, relation, the protocol is like this. The prover uh, has a VDSR. Uh, we omit the message M here as it can be directly recovered from. It's a Schnorr line protocol. Uh, during the first one, the prover samples a uh, Gaussian vector uh, y and uh, commits y by uh, uh, the vector w, then uh, sends w to the verifier. The verifier responds uh, it with uh, a ring element d. Uh, a ring element d sampled from special a uh, special space c. The prover uh, finally, uh, compute the uh, vector C by summing Y and the D times R and runs regime sampling algorithms and forward the output vector C to 
uh, the verify. The verify checks if uh, the vector z are small and uh, the equation a1 times uh, z equals to uh, w plus t times r or not. So the correct list is straightforward as d, y, d, and r are all small. And uh, uh, the equation I mentioned uh, above uh, implies the uh, uh, opening equation uh, described uh, in previous page. So uh, let's consider the uh, zero knowledge pro property of, of the park protocol. Intuitively, we want to uh, remove the dependency uh, of uh, Z on the weightless R. Um, one may uh, think to use the so called margin technical by adding a very large vector Y uh, to uh, hide the message of R. But this results a uh, very large. Uh, proof size. So um, the intuition of reject sampling is uh, to add another um, small y and uh, uh, output uh, z with some uh, independent or, or some, some certain probability. In this case, z does not reveal, reveal information of r. OK. <laughs> Concrete, uh, so concretely, the idea of reject simply is that uh, we have access to distribution G, Gx. For example, uh, uh, y plus t times r in our case. And uh, we like to sample from another independent distribution fx, such as this precaution. We can uh, define a concrete, uh, we can define a constant m that equals to the Maximum of f x divided by g x over all x in the domain of g. Then uh, the solution is that sample x from uh, the screen g uh, in the first step, and uh, output it with probability f x divided by m times g x, and uh, uh, repeat until it outputs the vector z in the second step. So it's easy to say that uh, the uh, distribution of x is uh, fx over uh, fx divided by m, which is independent of the original distribution gx. Uh, okay. So as mentioned earlier, uh, the motivation of reject sampling is to uh, reduce the proof size. So what should we concern about concrete algorithms? Uh, we can say from previous page, the expected number of repetitions is the big M, which is equal to the maximum of D uh, sigma Z, sigma KZ divided by uh, D, uh, D times R sigma KZ. Um, and further equals to uh, e to the minus two times the inner product of z and the d times r plus the square of the log of d times r over uh, two times the square of uh, the Gaussian term the sigma. So um, in order to uh, make, make the the, uh, the, the lambert uh, the, the right in lambert as small as possible, uh, one can uh, expect to make the uh, exponent parts as small as possible. So um, there are two strategies to do this. The first one is to make the uh, uh, numerate as small as possible, or uh, the second one is make the uh, denominator as large as possible. However, uh, if we make the, the, the Kilometer uh, larger, uh, which means that we make we make the uh, Gaussian parameter the sigma larger. Uh, as we know, the output size, the output vector z, it follows the uh, Gaussian distribution with uh, parameter sigma. So this also enlarges the output size. Uh, this is not a reasonable strategy. 
uh, our uh, we our second step is to make the uh, uh, a numerator as as small uh, as as small as possible. Okay. Uh, based on this idea, uh, Lubashevsky, Lui, and Ziller proposed the subset region sampling. The main uh, technological improvement compared with the original region sampling is adding uh, additional uh, rejection conditions, uh, which requires the inner product of Z and the times are both. This requirement, however, also let the adversary always load the signals of the inner product. Uh, in other words, Z, the public vector, is uh, it's, it's equivalent to a uh, like, uh, one bit information about the with this R. So uh, these are the concrete algorithms. We are uh, reject zero in the original one and the reject one in the subset reject sampling in LNS. So, in order to achieve better efficiency, um, we can uh, further set the set stricter conditions as the inner product greater than a positive integer p, or even with positive interval of b. Similarly, uh, these are included to only look one over the probability, probabilities of the two conditions happening. Uh, in the most uh, in the most uh, extreme case, one can even consider to only leak uh, the total value of the inner product. Based on this idea, we obtain the generalized subset reject sampling algorithm, reject two and reject three. Okay, so um, for concrete efficiency, the, uh, this, uh, the table in this page provides uh, parameters M, C, uh, repeat numbers, arguments, and side of C and uh, a leakage bits based on the law of V. And the further, uh, Calculated the uh, concrete values by instantiating the log of B, we obtain this table. Uh, we can say, compared with the original uh, sampling algorithm, uh, the generalized subset uh, region sampling improved the communication uh, efficiency by uh, 32% and improved the communication uh, efficiency by 10% compared with LNS21. Uh, Okay, so this improvement seems good. What's left to for us to do is showing the security of uh, the generalized subset of region sampling. From previous discussion, we know that uh, adversity uh, often the information of the inner product value. So to establish the zero knowledge security, we need to show the pseudonymous of MLW with linear linkage of sigma. Uh, for plan LW, uh, AP12 has already issued uh, a, re a reduction from plan LW to the uh, so called extended LW. However, uh, if we consider the rinkies, uh, things become uh, complicated as the previous results have limitations. When we uh, consider to apply the uh, AP12's reduction to the rinkies, uh, in the However, it uh, occurs exponential large reduction loss for dimension mismatch. Uh, one may uh, uh, consider the apply the uh, information theory uh, technical, such as uh, lossy model in L20, which yet results large modular rank uh, and is not com compatible to the small rank required in LNS31. The concurrent work BGRW uh, 22, PKLL plus 23, KLS 23, uh, uh, are also insufficient to analyze the framework of LNS1. 
So to deal with this issue, we should a reduction from research MLW to decision uh, MLW with linear linkage. Uh, we call it for MLW LS for sure. As the former is uh, in the standard harness assumption, uh, we can just accept the harness of a uh, laser based on the harness of standard less uh, problem over, over ideal less. Uh, our reduction uh, enjoys it uh, uh, enjoys the uh, the advantage that is with no uh, restriction on the module rank. And it's compatible with the low rank case uh, in our application. And uh, the adversary uh, has a uh, less re restriction as the hint can be specified by the adversary. Uh, we need to remark that the level of leakage terms in our reduction is bounded, uh, but it is still sufficient for our application as we uh, consider the one time or bounded, com bounded commitment in our application. So, um, concurrently, our target is show a reduction from 30 MLW to the decision of uh, uh, MLW uh, This means uh, that uh, given MLW samples and the decision MLW has Oracle D, uh, one want to, uh, one want to output the secret S. So, the Oracle D is to distinguish the tuple A, uh, A times S. The hidden and the, the function, uh, the linear function of S, uh, denoted, uh, de defined by Z, and the uh, two for A U Z, L Z S. So the linear function L Z S is defined by the uh, inner product of phi Z and phi S, where phi is the uh, uh, coefficient embedding of uh, uh, ring elements. Okay, so. The reduction route is that for uh, the intermediate problem, um, QI MLW is defined according to the ideal factor or QI of the ideal ring one. And the M, uh, MLW LG is defined as the MLW with the linear linkage of error. Okay, so, um, okay. Uh, at the high level, the, uh, the idea of step one is the reduction uh, in the reduction route is a random guess of the leakage, which is with the reduction was one over Q. And the step and the step two to five are similar to the search to decision reductions of bring out of and in LPR 10 and the LS uh, 15. Though difference in our uh, is that we should uh, additionally uh, simulate the leakage. And the step six is a uh, transformation from a with linear linkage of error uh, sample, sample to the MLW with, uh, uh, with linear linkage of secret. Okay. Oh, okay. So, uh, sorry for that. Um, so, let's summarize this talk. Uh, we show that there exists uh, a reduction from search. Uh, MLW to uh, decision MLW LS, uh, which provides a hardest lower bound of uh, the decision uh, uh, MLW LS. Uh, and uh, further views the uh, harness from the harness of worst case the ideal S problem. As, a, as an application, we propose a generalized subset region sampling algorithm that achieves better uh, efficiency than previous algorithms. And also, uh, and thus improves the efficiency of one time commitment based, uh, based uh, CKP overlaps. Uh, okay, so beyond this, we would like to further understand the harness of MLW with, um, with a leakage beyond the linear function under compact parameters. And uh, if the MLW, has, uh, MLW LS has other applications. Okay. So um, this is conference. Thanks, thanks for your attention. That's it. Any questions? Okay. Uh, if uh, um, if more repetition is allowed, mm -hmm. and uh, 
how the manage of your technical uh, over the L on A21 become less or more or more repetitive more repetition. Okay, that's a good question. Uh, uh, if you, the repetition number is it's longer, which means uh, uh, this means the uh, leakage bit should be should also uh, be larger. And uh, for concrete security, we we can um, estimate the concrete security by the concrete uh, uh, storing algorithm for LFD. So, which means uh, you need to uh, set a larger parameter to guarantee the uh, certain level of security, which results uh, better but with uh, worse security. Okay, and uh, let's thank uh, all the speakers in this session. Okay. I don't think we have much to say except thanks to everyone for coming. Thanks to all the speakers, who are the people who really made the conference interesting. Uh, and thanks to everybody on the PC. I'm going to hand over to next year's. This side should be there. So, uh, as Julian hinted last night, uh, next year's PKC will be organized in Burgos in Norway. Uh, our group at NTU in Trondheim organized Europe Group two years ago, and we thought it was so much fun that we wanted to organize something again. This time in a bit smaller scale, so uh, then we also decided to organize it in a smaller town. So, next year at Burgos, um, just a few words about the uh, people behind it. So uh, my name is Jan Zedda, and I will be the co-general chair together with Warren Ipa. Uh, we're in the technology group at NGNU. So we are a bunch of people. Um, this is some of us who will be organizing the conference. Um, and we're very much looking forward to welcome you next year. And for the program committee, so Jachin Khan, who was uh, chairing one of the sessions here uh, this afternoon, together with Ivo Yadia, and co-chairs, and are currently planning um, the program committee for next year. And the dates for next year, um, the submission deadline will be in mid-October. This will be two weeks roughly after the Europe deadline, which is supposed to be October 1st or 2nd. Um, there will be a rebuttal period and so on, so you will get notifications in February. Uh, Europe next year will be organized in Madrid from May 5 to May 8, and we then had a PKC in the week after. So if some of you are going to Europe for one of these conferences, please consider attending both of these while you're, you know, in the neighborhood. Uh, so this will be May 12 to May 15. Um, a few words about the uh, So we have uh, this hotel, the Vervos Hotel. Um, and for the conference venue, we have booked this and we have allocated hotel rooms for an open attendee so that everyone can stay in the same spot. And the conference uh, lecture hall will be a cinema like this. Um, how do you get there? So this is a really tiny town. So if you compare it to Atlanta last year and Sydney this year, this is a town with just uh, two or 3,000 people living there permanently. Uh, you can get there from Trondheim or from Oslo by train or uh, bus. We transport and we're planning to coordinate a PQC bus from the airport in Trondheim specifically for you coming to the conference that goes directly to the hotel. This will be an option when you register for the conference. 
Um, a few photos from Reus. So this is a really, really dark, nice uh, town on the UNESCO heritage uh, list of protected uh, places. There's a lot of wooden uh, houses. It's an old uh, church in the, in the neighborhood. Um, it's really a beautiful place to walk around. This is a photo from May, uh, some years ago. So this is what you can roughly expect in May next year. Um, it's a really charming place. There's some old mines and we're planning a guided tour for those who are interested. Uh, for those of you interested in animals, there's a lot of rain there in the area. Uh, might be even uh, organizing some uh, trips with reindeers. Uh, and also there is a local brewery. So for those of you who want to spend the uh, evening off tasting beer, this is also a good option for the conference. Uh, that was me. Uh, there will be um, the, the National Day of the Constitution Day of Norway is May, May 17th. So this will be just uh, two days after the conference. So if you have the time and want to stay a few more days to celebrate uh, together with us, which includes, you know, uh, champagne for breakfast and waiting for the tribes and stuff like this, this is a great opportunity to do exactly that. And uh, that's it. And I hope to see many of you next year. Thank you. Right. Okay, thank you. Uh, so on behalf of the organization committee, I would like to thank everyone for attending this conference. So I believe uh, all of you have enjoyed, of course, the very excellent program. But uh, more importantly, from my point of view, is I hope you have enjoyed your stay in Australia. And also, hopefully, you also enjoyed the zoo tour and also the spectacular view of the dinner last night. Uh, one thing, one final thing that I would like to mention is actually all of those work that all the things that you have uh, seen, they are they didn't happen just instantly. They actually happened due to all the hard work of uh, staff behind the scene. So on this occasion, actually, I would like to thank a few people uh, who really worked very hard for this event to happen. Right. So I'm one of the few uh, lucky people, but I'm just commending people to do the work, but uh, actually there are many people who really work behind the scene to make this happen. So the first one is actually is, uh, Dr. Yana Lee here. So let's uh, thank her together. And uh, Dr. Judy Jang, who is our photographer, technical support. We would like to thank also Dr. Nan Lee, who's been working with us. And uh, Dr. Yumei Lee, uh, who is somewhere uh, behind. Where's Yumei? <laughs> He's still working outside. <laughs> All of those hot hard work actually due to these four amazing people. So they are the one who really work behind the scene. Uh, so on behalf of Fu Chun Bo and, my, and myself, thank you very much again for coming and have a uh, safe journey home and hope to see you all next year in Norway. Right, thank you.